What's up, everybody? My name is Shane Kohler, and this is The Conscious Love Show. Thanks so much for joining me here, where each week I'm sharing true-to-life insights and experiences from my journey and how I've created the loving and committed partnership I have today. I answer your questions and have live discussions with you so I can support you in your specific situation. And I bring in experts and people who know their stuff so we can all learn from their perspectives. Thanks again for checking out the show. Please subscribe on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on the most. And I would love it so much if you'd leave a review and tell people what you think of us. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at The Living Relationship to connect more closely. And I'm grateful to be supporting you on your journey to love. So welcome back, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Conscious Love Show. Um, As always, it's a pleasure to be here. I have a conversation today that I've been really looking forward to. It's it's been on my mind, and you know what I want to what I want to speak into today is the um, conversation of polarity between masculine and feminine energy, and just a, kind of a general overview of what are these energies, what are the uh, like what are these things, how do they work, how do they operate, why are they important, what do they mean. Um, last week on the podcast, I had a conversation with a dear friend and mentor of mine named Liz Haber, excuse me, Liz Haber, who, uh, who's just an incredible woman, incredible teacher. She's been a coach and a mentor of mine for a lot of years. And, um, I had a conversation with her about embodying feminine energy to attract a masculine partner. And if you haven't, uh, caught that episode, it was a really great episode we did, Um, excellent conversation. Liz is brilliant. I was just telling everybody on Instagram with me that if you haven't had an opportunity to experience Liz yet or, or get to know her, learn from her, um, it's definitely a treat. So I would definitely say, go, uh, go check out that episode and soak up some of her wisdom and, and all the stuff she has to share. Cause you know, it's, it's really always amazing anytime I get to talk with her, but, um, in today's episode, I, I wanted to speak less about embodying feminine energy, which is something that I don't necessarily think I'm an expert in, but I wanted to talk more about the polarity of masculine and feminine energy. And what does this mean in dating? What does it mean in a relationship? Um, And this has been like quite a trending topic in recent, I'd say this year and last year, I've seen it becoming more and more popular where more and more people are talking about this idea of polarity, this idea of masculine and feminine energy. And this is something that, you know, I used to sit in trainings when I was getting my education, I mean, I don't know, 10 years ago, and it was something that used to be talked about. And I've always heard it maybe a little bit different than the way it's, it's presented in, um, in, in the media now. It's, it, you know, I, I, so I think I have a unique perspective to offer on this conversation. And if we want to just start by you know, exploring this, well, what is masculine and feminine energy? What does that even mean? When we talk about polarity, what is polarity? Uh, How to create polarity, why to create polarity? So I want to just unpack some of these questions. And um, masculine and feminine energy, if we're just to start with what is it, it's, I mean, kind of the building block of, or the building blocks of the universe. So the, you know, we could say in, in the beginning, there was one, and this was the source. This was the, you know, in, in quantum physics, uh, in quantum physics, they talk about a singularity. They talk about, um, you know, in, in the beginning there was one and the one split itself into two and then there were three and, and then, and then the, um, you know, the progression just kind of followed that. But so if we could say the one split itself into two, so you could call that God or source or whatever you, whatever you want to call that, uh, thing that started us all the thing that started the universe, the thing that started creation. But there was this uh, singularity or this this one entity in which everything that would ever exist in the universe was contained. And in science, they call it the Big Bang, where you know this, this one singularity, uh, enough energy had built up inside of it that it exploded outward, and that was the Big Bang, and then planets and life and started to come into being. And But when this one source, this one origin point of life in the universe um, split itself, we could say it split itself into masculine and feminine energy, right? And then these became the, the two building blocks of the universe. 
And life is made up of the different combinations of this energy. And this is where we get gender from. We have men and women, which are, you know, physiological expressions of masculine and feminine energy. And of course, and it's important, especially in this day and age to, to talk about how, you know, we also have men like physical males that have predominantly feminine energy in them, right? We also have women, physical females that predominantly have masculine energy in them. And we have, you know, people who maybe have so much feminine or so much masculine energy that they actually want to change their gender to feel like their body reflects more of what's on the inside, right? So it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily about gender because these, these energies exist in all of us and we all have both in us, right? We all have masculine energy in us. We all have feminine energy in us. And that's whether you're a male or a female, it doesn't matter. We, we all have both but we tend to predominate in one. And so if you have, for example, a man who might predominate in feminine energy, well, that might be a very effeminate man. Maybe he is gay or maybe he's not gay. Maybe he's just a very feminine guy. And then you might have women who also dominate masculine energy. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of obvious what that looks like. We've all, we've all seen women who express that way. But traditionally, um, and the way it pertains to probably most of the people who are listening to this conversation is that, you know, women are going to be predominantly uh, feminine energetically and men are going to be predominantly masculine energetically. And I want to say for anyone who is maybe in a gay relationship or anyone who might be trans or, or anyone who, you know, might be on that spectrum in some way. This conversation absolutely applies because these energies exist in all of us and they, and they shape how we relate. They shape our lives. They shape how we feel. They shape how we experience ourselves, how we experience other people. So it definitely, um, it definitely is relevant for all people, but the way I'm going to have this conversation or the way I'm going to frame this conversation just for simplicity's sake and just so we can really understand uh, the way we're going to talk about it without getting it too complicated or without going into every nuance of the conversation, we're going to talk about it. Whereas when we speak about men, we're going to speak about being predominantly masculine in their energy. When we speak about women, we'll speak about being predominantly feminine in their energy. And so anyone who may not personally express that way, you'll need to be able to take the underlying principles here that we're talking about and find out how they relate to you in your life and your experience, right? So if you're, if you're maybe a woman who is very masculine or a man who is more feminine, or maybe you're gay or, or maybe you're, you know, in, in, in that domain in any respect, you'll need to take these principles and figure out how they apply to you in your situation. And when there is a masculine presence and a feminine presence. And each of these are, uh, strongly grounded in that, in that presence, right? What be it masculine or feminine, there's a certain magnetism that exists between them. There's a certain polarity that exists between them. So if we're going to talk about a man strongly in his masculine and a woman strongly in her feminine, there's going to be a certain magnetism that exists there. There's going to be a certain um, energetic connection where it's not about it's not about they even need to talk or they even need to um, they even need to you know know each other really. This is like a lot of times this is how you know that kind of attraction at first sight happens. It's actually an energetic thing. And I've often said that I don't think what we call physical attraction, I don't really think it's about how someone looks. I think it's about the energetic vibrational signature that they put off and what, how that interacts with our energetic vibrational signature. And when we experience that with someone, you know, when we experience that kind of syncing up of our vibrational states or our energetic states, and they like kind of lock into each other and they connect. And then we look at that person and we go, oh, there's something about the energy that I'm feeling right now that makes me desire them or makes me want them or makes me want to get close to them or touch them or, you know, be sexual with them in some way. That experience that we have is actually a vibrational energetic experience but because we interpret that experience through our minds, 
through our eyes, through our five senses, we say, oh, that person's sexy. I like the way they look. It's not actually about the way they look. It's about how we feel in their presence. It's about how our energies are mixing and connecting with each other and, and how that feels inside of our body when that happens. And that makes us go like, oh, I like the way that person looks, but it's actually not really about how they look because there might be someone else who might look similar, but you don't have that same attraction to them. And so there, uh, this polarity, right? When you're somebody who is predominantly in your feminine and you meet someone who is predominantly in their masculine, there's a certain polarity there that, that creates an attraction, that creates a, a want to get close to each other. But now I, I think that something that's important to discuss here is that there is a healthy masculine and a healthy feminine. And there is also a toxic masculine and a toxic feminine. And those of us who are grounded in the toxic masculine or the toxic feminine are going to experience that energetic vibrational attraction with people who are also in the toxic expression of that energy, right? So let's, let's talk about just a couple of things of how, how do masculine and feminine energy look? What are some of the qualities or characteristics that represent those energies? And then how do they look in a toxic representation and how do they look in a healthy representation? So masculine energy to start there is very focused, very directed. And those of you who have, you know, maybe been a part of this conversation or heard this before, you've probably heard this, right? Masculine energy is focused. It's directed. It's I've, I've uh, seen women um, post like memes and stuff, which always crack me up because, because they're like, you know, if you, if you send a man a text message, and you ask him three questions, he's only going to answer the first one. And I, I always like crack up when I see that because like that, that has literally happened with like me and my wife, you know, she'll send me a text message with three questions in it. I'll read it far enough to get to the first question. I'll answer the first question and then think I'm done and not even realizing that there were two more questions there. Now, why does that happen, right? Well, because that's how masculine energy works. Masculine energy is very focused. It's very directed. Um, one of the best people who teaches this conversation, uh, her name is Alison Armstrong, and she has she's a woman who has spent her life studying the differences between men and women, studying masculine and feminine energy, studying how you know different energies show up in different genders, and and she just I mean she's put together an incredible body of work around this stuff, but she has. Um, she has a book called Understanding Men and also a book called Understanding Women. And I've read both of them. They're both fantastic books. Um, because what she does is she just really breaks down some of these like fundamental differences in, in how we think, how we approach situations, how we operate. And it's actually hilarious. Like it just, it just makes you laugh when you actually see like the way she lays all of this out. And, and it's just like so funny, like, oh yeah, I've been experiencing this my whole life. I never realized why it was happening. I never realized that it was a difference between men and women. And sometimes we even get pissed off or annoyed about it. But it's like, when you understand, like, this is just the nature of humans and, and how we operate and how we, you know, are in relationship with each other and the differences between masculine and feminine energy. It's just, it's, it's really, it's really cool to, to see it. And it's actually funny to like see, oh yeah, I've been doing that my whole life. I never realized it's just cause I'm a man. Right. But, um, so anyway, the, the masculine energy is very directed. What Alison Armstrong says about it is, is men listen from two places. They listen from what's the point or what's the problem. Right. So, you know, when a, when a woman is, um, is sharing, and this is something that, you know, often happens with me and my wife, you know, she'll come home from work or from her day or whatever she was doing, and she'll just be sharing. She'll just be kind of unloading what is, what has happened for her, what she saw, what she experienced, what she did, what she thought about, what she felt. Like she's just, whatever's on her heart, whatever's on her mind, she's just releasing it. She's just unloading it. And me, I'm sitting here going, what's the point and what's the problem, <laughs> right? And then, yeah, I mean, I don't do this so much anymore because I've, I've learned better, 
But, you know, back in the early days or, you know, and it would sometimes even lead to frustration because she would just be unloading all this stuff and there is no point and there is no problem. It's just simply, it's just simply her expressing herself in our relationship. But I'm sitting here sometimes even getting frustrated because I'm going, I'm not getting the point. Why are you telling me this? I'm not understanding. I, I feel like I'm missing something. I feel right. So this is like a, a fundamental difference between masculine and feminine energy where the masculine energy is like looking for the point, is looking for the problem, is looking for where's the problem and how can I fix it? What's the solution? I have a goal. I have an objective, right? It's like, uh, it's, it's very much the military runs on masculine energy, right? The military is like, we have an objective. We have a goal. We've got to get in. We've got to do these three things. We've got to complete the mission, right? That is very masculine oriented. Uh, Alison Armstrong said this. It always cracked me up when... Um, you know, she says like when a, when a man walks in the store to buy shoes, he's looking for shoes. And if he has a woman with him and they're walking through the aisles and the woman says, oh, well, this is a really nice shirt. The man says that's not shoes <laughs> because he has an objective. He has a goal. He has a mission, right? I'm here to get shoes. Yeah, that's a nice shirt. I'm not here for a shirt. I'm here for shoes. It used to drive me crazy when I would go shopping with like my girlfriends in the past and I would be there with a list to try to get something. And they'd be like, oh, look at this. Look at the, they'd be like stopping in the aisles, trying to like look at every little thing they see on the shelves. And it would be driving me crazy. Like we're on a time crunch here. We've got to get the shoes and get out, right? So these are, these are some of the differences. Whereas the masculine has an objective. He has a goal. He has, you know, something he wants to get in, get the job done and get out. If there's a problem, he wants to fix it. And when... When he is disconnected from the feminine, he he is very much in like a myopic, um, like myopic, you know, objective oriented, a tunnel vision kind of operating, right? The feminine is very different than that. The feminine actually has no real objective, no real goal. She's not trying to accomplish anything or get anywhere. She lives in the moment. She, she lives in the experience of what's happening now, right? So when I, uh, in a couple of the examples I gave where my wife comes home and she's unloading her day on me or just, I don't mean that in any kind of negative way. It's just what she's doing. She's unloading everything that's happened, everything she's feeling, everything that's on her heart. She's just releasing it. She's just letting it out. She's in her feminine, just expressing herself in the moment. There is no point. There is no problem. There is nothing to resolve. There is nothing to get to. She's just being present in the moment, expressing what's real for her. But if I'm, if I'm disconnected from the feminine, if I'm not present to what's happening for her and her experience, then I'm in my masculine going, what's the point? What's the problem? I'm not getting it. Why aren't you communicating clearly? And there, there can be frustration in that. A lot of the a lot of the arguments that happen between men and women happen because of these kinds of miscommunications, right? Where the, the feminine is often just trying to express herself and the man is trying to solve what she's sharing. And she says, no, I, I don't want you to solve what I'm sharing. I just want you to listen, right? And, and he's going, why are you telling me stuff if you don't want me to do anything about it, right? So these are, these are some of the, the miscommunications that can happen here. Right. When a when a woman or, or a, when a, when she's in her feminine, at least when she's in the store, she might be there with a list where she's like, OK, I got to get these three things. But when she's in the store, she's not connected to the list going point by point, checking things off the list. She's present to her experience in the store. So if there's a shirt or if there's something that catches her eye on the shelf, she's experiencing all of it. She's in the moment. She's um, the feminine flows right? So there's a, there's a certain flow to her. There's a certain grace. There's, she's not, she's not rushed, right? The, the idea of being rushed is a masculine idea. We've got to get this done by this time in this way. And we've got to handle it in excellence. Like those are all masculine ideas. The feminine is like, she's just flowing. She's just going, if, if the, if the energy calls her over here, she flows with that. If the energy calls her over here, she flows with that. And she's just present to the experience in the moment. She's not in this objective of what do I need to get done? What do I need to achieve? What needs to happen? Okay. Now, 
I, I want to be clear about this because there's sometimes a tendency to bring judgment into this conversation. Um, and I'm just going to encourage everyone as we talk about these things to, to withhold judgment because there's nothing in this that says one is right or one is wrong. One is better than the other. You know, it should be done this way or it should be done that way. They're both actually vitally important. Like, this is what I want everyone to understand is, is like masculine and feminine energy are both vitally important to who we are. And whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're gay, whether you're straight, whether you're trans, whether like it doesn't really matter. Having access and being in touch with both the masculine parts of your being and the feminine parts of your being are essential to being a well-rounded human. And so it's not that one of these is better than the other. It's not that, you know, it should be done more masculine or it should be done more feminine, but it's about actually being in touch with both of these energies and how they show up with inside, how they show up inside of you. And of course, one is going to dominate. One is going to be more prevalent in you. You're going to express one more fully. The other is going to be less obvious or less dominant. But if you're completely disconnected from the other side, that's when it becomes toxic. So earlier I spoke about how there is healthy masculinity and healthy femininity. And then there's also toxic masculinity and toxic femininity. And healthy masculinity and healthy femininity are basically when someone, so we could say like uh, me, if, if I'm a masculine expressing person, right? I'm, I'm definitely a man. I definitely identify as a man. I definitely express in a masculine way. I definitely, you know, am predominated by masculine energy. And yet I'm very in touch with my feminine side. And so that creates a healthy masculinity. The toxic masculine is when uh, a man or, or even a woman, but when somebody is so in their masculine and they have disconnected from the feminine aspects of themselves. So the feminine aspects are the sensitivity, the compassion, the nurturing, the caring, the gentleness, the understanding, the wisdom, the creativity, the, the sense of like really being alive and really being connected to life, being connected to nature. Uh, it's, it's the holistic view of life, right? So I'm not just in my isolated experience, but I'm connected to the fact that my experience is related to everyone else's experience. And there's a holistic view of life and how we're all connected and how we're all related together, okay? These are all feminine aspects, and when a man, or again, it could be anyone, but I'm going to speak about a man here. When, when a man is so in his masculine energy of achieving the goal of, you know, completing the mission of having an agenda and following through the agenda of fixing the problem of, you know, this, this focused single pointed awareness of like being task oriented, wanting to complete the job. So when a man is all the way in into that without being connected to the feminine aspects of himself, which are his sensitivity, which are his compassion, which are his intuitive, uh, his intuitive ability, which is his creativity, which is his greater wisdom, right? When he's disconnected from those parts of himself, he, he becomes the toxic masculine. So it becomes about completing the mission at all costs regardless of how it affects anyone else. And, you know, if we're, if we're going to talk about completing the mission, like what might the mission be for men in our world who are expressing toxic masculinity? The mission might be to get laid. The mission might be to have a good time. The mission might be to validate himself. The mission might be to get something he wants. The mission might be to achieve a certain goal. The mission might be to, I mean, right, anything along these lines. But when he is expressing in his toxic masculinity, he is going about achieving the goal or getting what he wants without any regard to how his actions or his approach is affecting anyone else. And 
if he were to if he were to tune that by being connected to his own feminine energy he might have a lot of the same goals he might have a lot of the same objectives he might want to make money he might want to have a successful career he might want to get laid he might you know so he might have a lot of the same goals the same uh, uh, things he wants to achieve but if he were to be in touch with his feminine aspects then he would also be connected to the holistic view of how him achieving his goals is related to everyone and everything else. And he would have to find a way of achieving those goals that would not hurt anyone, that would, that would take into account his connectedness to everything. So he would be accessing that greater wisdom. He would be accessing that intuitive sense. He would be accessing that compassion, that connectedness, right? So toxic masculinity is actually healed by connecting to his feminine aspects. Now, there is a toxic feminine as well. The toxic feminine shows up with things like victimhood, with martyrdom, with complaining, with uh, like nagging or badgering, with um, controlling and manipulating, right? So these are all aspects of the toxic feminine. The toxic feminine is, again, it could be anyone because men definitely have the capacity to experience victimhood and complaining and, you know, all these kinds of things. So it, it could be anyone. But if we're talking about a woman who's in her toxic feminine, the toxic feminine is, is uh, we'll, we'll talk about it as though it's a woman, a woman who is disconnected from her masculine. Okay, so she has no um no connection to the the masculine presence which in a in a woman the masculine presence creates a sense of confidence a sense of security a sense of safety a sense of groundedness a sense of like feeling safe in her own body a sense of feeling secure within her own life right this is this is what um a- accessing her masculine presence gives to a woman when she is out of touch with her own masculine presence, she feels unsafe. She feels insecure. She feels unworthy. She feels alone. She feels unlovable, right? So all of the, all of the parts of herself that are going to allow her to feel secure, to feel strong within herself, to feel confident, to feel like she can stand on her own two feet, that's all going to come from her connecting with her masculine. And when she's disconnected from her own masculine, she falls into the toxic feminine, which is the manipulation, the control, the victimhood, the complaining, the judging, the criticizing, the nagging, the, all of that kind of stuff, right? That's all what she falls into to try to protect herself because she doesn't feel safe, because she doesn't feel secure. So the, the toxic aspects of these, of these energies are healed by connecting to the other side. The toxic masculine is healed by connecting to the feminine. The toxic feminine is healed by connecting to the masculine. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that you go connect with another person, although I, I will say that's definitely a part of it, right? So for, for anyone, man or woman, if you find yourself living in more of your toxic uh, aspects, then the solution or, or the way to heal one of the avenues would be to be around healthy, uh, for, for a man or, or toxic masculine, it would be to be around healthy feminine energy or for the feminine, it would be to be around healthy masculine energy to start to feel into that energy, to start to, you know, regulate your system to that energy and that will help you embody some of your own. There are also other practices, and we could talk about that uh, maybe in a little bit. But what I want to say is that our world, and, and this is, you know, when we talk about the patriarchy, what we're really talking about is the toxic masculine energy that has dominated our world. So, and I, I think this is pretty pervasive across the world, no matter what culture you're in. It might be less so in some cultures than others. 
but our world has been dominated by toxic masculine energy. And this is what the patriarchy is, right? People who are, people were talking about bringing down the patriarchy, right? What they're talking about is, is like changing this toxic masculinity that rules the world. So what is that? Well, it's the, it is this achieve the goal at any cost, right? We have, we have a certain objective, right? Which the objective in our world has been like control, domination, and profit. And so the, the major energy that runs our world is, you know, dominate the resources, whether that's oil, whether that's, uh, you know, currency, what, whatever, whatever the resources might be, but dominate the resources. Um, you know, everybody wants their country to have more power than other countries. This is all, this is all part of the toxic masculine, right? It is this domination control, um, achieve the goal, achieve the objective at all costs. And so because on a large scale, our world is run in this toxic masculine energy, we as, as people, as you know, on a, on a, on a microcosm, we are all swimming in the water called toxic masculinity. And so what happens as a result of this is one, like everybody, men and women and, and everyone else, like all of us are, are to a degree living in that toxic masculine. You know, it's culturally, it's woven into everything that we learn, everything that we are. It's woven into our movies and television. It's woven into our music. It's like, you know, this toxic masculinity is just so pervasive in our culture. And the way that trickles down into our, you know, the microcosm into our personal lives is that, you know, we, for the most part, we all live in a culture that places value on achievement. And so your, your worthiness is equated with what you do or what you produce right? If you have a good job, you make a lot of money, you have a lot of things, you have a lot of success, your worthiness is, is equated with that. And if you don't have that, or you know, you're lower status in some way, then your worthiness is equated with that. And this is all symptomatic of toxic masculinity, right? This kind of equating worthiness to achievement and you're, you are what you do. This is all symptomatic of that. Again, that toxic masculinity, and what we're really doing on the planet now, as we, as we grow into a higher level of consciousness, is we're all growing into more of a validation of our feminine essence and um, learning, to, learning to see that part of ourselves, acknowledge that, and value that. And this is, this is for men and women both right? We all need to kind of outgrow this toxic masculine mindset that has us live a life where, you know, so, so much of the world dedicates the majority of their time to something that they don't even love. I mean, if, if you think about how tragic that is, like this is, this is your life, which is your time, which is your energy, right? So your time is your energy. Like how you, how you spend your time is what you give your life force energy to. And because of this toxic masculinity and the value systems that are established because of that, most of the people in the world are spending the majority of their time, the majority of their energy, the majority of their life force, giving it to something that they don't even love something that's not even meaningful to them. And what this, what this awakening, and I think COVID brought on this to, to a huge degree, this awakening of, you know, when we were all forced to stay home and we were all forced to kind of rethink our lives and rethink what we were doing and how we were living. And a lot of people started quitting their jobs. I think they called it the great departure, right? But a lot of people started quitting their jobs and a lot of people started finding side hustles and a lot of people started online businesses. And you know, what was actually happening 
was there was a there was a restructuring of our collective value systems and people were starting to ask themselves like what's really important in our lives what really matters in our lives like what and and there was a, a connected uh there was a connecting to the the depth of life and the meaning of life and the meaning of my life and the the opportunity to be creative and the opportunity to be passionate and the like these are all feminine aspects right where it's not just about the goal it's not just about achievement it's not just about the results but it's about how do i feel in the journey it's about being in touch with the the sensitivity of my being right so if i need to rest i rest a lot of you know a lot of people i mean even now but especially prior to the pandemic like hadn't rested in years and and in fact like culturally and and again this is still present but i, I think we have we have made some progress with it since the pandemic but this is still present like culturally if you need to sleep, you're viewed as lazy. Sleep, which is one of our most fundamental needs, which like if you want to be happy and you want to be healthy and you want your body to work well and you want to think clearly and you want to feel good, you need adequate sleep. Like that's not even, that's not even up for discussion, right? And, and, and I came from a world like when I, when I grew up and this was in personal development, right? This was in like transformational work and, and people would kind of like poo poo on sleep and they'd be like, Oh, you know, I slept six hours in, in the last three days, like, and I'm doing just fine. And this was like, it was, it was very much like this toxic masculine mindset of not caring for yourself where self care was, was kind of dismissed or undervalued. And what, what our awakening, our collective awakening as human beings is really about is it's about blending uh, um, the masculine energy that has dominated our world with the feminine energy that is lying dormant inside of us, which is the sensitivity, which is the creativity, which is the compassion, which is the understanding. And as we grow into this, as we, as we balance these different energies within our collective and within our individual being, as we grow into this, what we're creating the opportunity for is for those who identify as masculine to really step into a strong, healthy, masculine role, right? So what does that look like? Well, that's the role of protector, provider, caretaker, supporter, right? The, the one who, the one who goes out and hunts all the food for the tribe and brings it back and cooks it and prepares it for everyone, right? Like that, that's the, that's the archetype of healthy masculine. And we're, we're, um, we're opening up the possibility for those who identify as feminine, uh, feminine to step into more of that healthy feminine role. So what is that healthy feminine role? Well, that is the, yes, as I've spoken about, the creativity, the nurturing, the compassion, the understanding, the connecting all things, the bringing all things together, the, the community aspect, the interconnectedness, the interrelatedness of everything. So I know I've, I've talked about a lot. I've talked about kind of lofty ideas of how this all shows up on a global scale. And the reason I wanted to really um, speak into all of that was because I wanted you to have an overview of how these energies operate. Like I, I wanted you to get like the, the energetic dynamics and I wanted you to understand these energetic dynamics. And if you can see the, the large scale patterns and the, the large scale qualities of these energies, then you can also connect the dots into how they show up in relationships. So I want to take some time now and just speak about how these energies show up in personal relationships. So the toxic, I want to say like, how do I express this? It's like 
the toxic masculine and the toxic feminine, they kind of, um, they kind of lend to each other. Like what'll, what'll happen is if, if you are living in, if you are living in the toxic aspect of one of these energies, then what's, what's going to happen is you're, and it kind of goes without saying, but you're not, you're not stepping into the greatness of your being, right? You're not really, um, you're not really expressing the, the potential greatness of your being. You're, you're living in the smallest version of who you can be. So as we talked about earlier, the toxic masculine is like a, achieve the goal at all costs, get what I want, regardless of how it impacts anyone else. So a lot of, you know, the, the questions I get are, uh, and you know, my audience is mostly women. I do get questions from men as well, but, but a lot of the women who reach out to me are asking things like, why didn't he call right in some form or another, or why did he disappear? Or why did he ghost me? Or, you know, after we hooked up, why didn't he want to see me again? Or, you know, these are the kinds of questions that I get a lot of. And what it often is, is someone who's experiencing the toxic masculine, right? So what, what this is, is somebody who was out to get what he wanted, who was out to achieve the goal with no regard for how it was impacting anyone else, right? So that, that is the toxic masculine. So these, these guys who are out there in the world living in the toxic masculine now, like how did they become this? Well, this is, this is the energy they were brought up in, right? And, and it's the energy that they have been taught in every aspect of their lives, not just about relationships. So young boys, especially, and, and young girls are taught this too, but young boys especially are taught to compete. They're taught to be better than the other boys. They're taught like, I mean, and again, like young, young boys and young girls are, are really cruel to each other. But there is a certain energy that, that uh, boys are, are um, taught, which is about competition, which is about winning, which is about beating other people, which is, uh, and then this is, you know, when this is translated into our adult lives and this is translated into the business world, well, it makes perfect sense that like, you know, we're, we're making millions and millions of dollars while stripping the world of all the resources that it has to offer. And like, like it's just, it's a perfect translation to what we're taught as children and then how we embody that as adults and how it shows up in dating or in relationships is that this, this boy who was raised being taught to compete being taught to dominate, being taught to, you know, achieve the goal regardless of consequence, being taught to deny his own needs and his own desires in favor of achieving the goal, right? So he might have he might have needed to rest, he might have needed to sleep, he might have needed to take care of himself in some way, but he's been taught to ignore those intuitive messages and achieve the goal at all costs. So I don't care if you need to sleep, get up at 5 a.m. and go run those laps, right? Like this is this is the, the culture that we've all been raised in. And so, and also I just wanna say, like he's also been overtly taught throughout his life to sleep with as many women as he can because that's what makes you as a man. Or don't let a woman get the best of you. Don't let a woman, like, you know, don't don't let a woman get power over you. So if you become too sensitive, which is, which is his feminine aspects, right? If you get too sensitive, if you get too vulnerable, if you fall in love, if you let a woman have power over you, well, now you're a chump, right? So these are, these are the messages that young boys are raised with. This is the water we swim in, all of us. And so, and so when we get to be adults, like, yes, there is within every man, this like deep desire for intimacy, this deep desire for connection, this deep desire for like heartfelt, heartfelt, vulnerable, like being in tune and being in touch with another person, being seen, being held, being loved, being loving. Like th there is not a single man on the planet who does not desire these things 
or, or, or want these things in his heart. But what men are struggling with in, in every, I mean, in varying degrees, you know, some men, maybe they had a very sensitive, tuned in mother like I did. And, you know, fortunately, I've been more in touch with my feminine side because I was raised by a single mother and she was very loving and, and affectionate and all those things. So, so those things aren't so scary for me the way they are for some men. But for men who did not have that, or maybe, you know, maybe they had a mother who was loving and supportive, but they also had a very strong uh, father who tended towards toxic masculine, right? Who shamed them for vulnerability, who shamed them for sensitivity. Now you have an adult man who might be 35, 40, 50 years old, who's been living his whole life, achieving the goal at all costs, no awareness of how his impacts or how his actions impact others around him, no awareness of the holistic connectedness of everything. He hasn't developed his ability to be compassionate or in tune with other people's emotions. And he's been taught to never let a woman get the best of him and to not feel too strongly. And now here he is out in the world trying to have relationships because relationship is fundamental to who he is and he craves it in the same way that everybody craves it but he's got all these blockages that have been built up throughout his life and so what he actually needs to do well before i get there i just want to say so so women might be meeting men like this and they might be, you know, really trying to do their best to be a, a great person and a great partner and, and showing up and, and, you know, being awesome and going like, why the hell, you know, what's wrong with me? Like, why didn't he call me? Like, I'm awesome. I showed up awesome. You know, we had a good time. We had a connection. Well, like you've got to understand this might be what's going on for him. Right. So like what could be happening and the reason he didn't call might be because he did actually like you and he was a, and he was afraid of how much he liked you. And it's easier for him to go out and keep chasing people or keep, you know, chasing those quick hit experiences or maybe, you know, your power and the power that you showed up with was intimidating for him because he, he doesn't, he doesn't have He's not connected enough to his own feminine to know how to handle a strong feminine presence, right? And so he needs to be in his toxic masculine, which vibrationally syncs him up to the toxic feminine. So he needs to connect with a weaker feminine presence because he's intimidated by the strong feminine, by the empowered feminine, right? So these are what what I really want to communicate here is that like, there is a lot of complexity to this. There is a lot of stuff going on under the surface for all of us, but, but especially what we're talking about right now is, is for men and how they are raised, the conditioning they receive, the, uh, the, because, because culturally, Men are taught that to be manly is to be the toxic masculine. It requires an incredible amount of courage on the part of a man to be willing to challenge that toxic masculinity. Where, whereas all the men in his life might be living in that toxic masculinity. And he has to choose to get in tune with his feminine side. He has to choose to get in touch with his own sensitivity, his own vulnerability. In relationship with a woman, he has to choose to open himself up to a kind of relatedness in a relationship that the men, the male role models in his life have told him to never do, have told him that to do that is to be weak is to give a woman power over him, is to make himself a chump or to make himself whatever characterization they gave it, right? And so this is the, the male journey, right? For, for men who identify as men is, 
it is the it is the willingness to challenge that toxic masculinity and to challenge the view of of manhood and of being a man that has been sold to him or impressed upon him throughout his life and to get in touch with his own feminine side and to to step into a more holistic view of being a man. So for women, it's, I would say, almost, almost a little more complex than that. Because women have not only toxic femininity, but they also have their own toxic masculinity because of being raised in a, in a toxic masculine culture. So there's, there's almost like a, an extra layer of complexity here because what, what we often see with women are a vacillation bouncing back and forth between the toxic masculine and the toxic feminine. So the toxic masculine is achieve the goal at all costs, you know, and, but because it's blended with the toxic feminine, there's the degree of manipulation involved. There's the degree of victimhood involved. And so what you often find are women who are trying to push through and force the objective, but also falling into the victimhood around it. So trying to force the objective, but then it didn't happen and I feel like a victim about it. Or then it didn't happen the way I wanted it to and so I'm going to try to manipulate it. Or I'm going to try to... Um, control it in, in some kind of manipulative way. And so for the women, for, for a woman or for someone who identifies as feminine, the, the way to, the way to step into the healthy feminine is again, by expressing, um, by getting in touch with your masculine qualities. So the toxic feminine is in relationship. And, and I saw actually somebody posted a comment here. They said, they said toxic masculine is avoidant and toxic feminine is anxious. They were asking if, if that was the way it is. And um, so when we talk about uh, attachment styles, right, we have avoidant attachment and anxious attachment. Avoidant attachment being the always pulling away, always avoiding the uh, feminine being more anxious. Now, uh, or excuse me, the anxious being more like leaning into relationship, reaching for it, craving it, wanting more of it. Like I can never get close enough kind of thing. And so the question is, is, um, is toxic masculinity avoidant and toxic femininity anxious? And I would say, um, that's a, that's an astute observation. And, uh, to a large extent, yeah, I, I think that is, that is true. But I, I think, you know, there, there is some nuance there and I'm not going to be able to go into all the nuance of it, but, but I think, you know, that those are themes that can be observed in a large way. So yeah, we, we could say that the toxic masculine is going to be more of the avoidant role and the toxic feminine is going to be more of the anxious role. And this is often why you, you see, um, you see in dating women often being in more of the anxious role and men often being in more of the avoidant role. But I say there's nuance there because I, I mean, I have often experienced myself as having more of an anxious attachment style. I have often um, like have women in my programs who experience more of an avoidant style, right? So, um, you know, that, that could be due to a predominance of masculine or feminine energy, but it could also just be due to the, the way you were raised and your upbringing and the way attachment formed when you were younger. But uh, I'll just suffice it to say that those are, those are themes that can be observed. But the, the toxic feminine in, in dating, like she's going to show up as being very insecure as being very inauthentic, as feeling not enough in some way. And so what she's going to do is try to present herself in some way other than how she is. 
as a form of manipulation to get what she wants, right? As an attempt to secure that safety for herself, right? So the, the toxic feminine is seeking a relationship with the masculine to make up for a sense of security that she doesn't feel within herself. And she's doing this through manipulative tactics. She's doing this through guilt. She's doing this through blame. She's doing this through, um, uh, like any, like martyrdom is a, is a method that's used. And, and so these are, these are the ways that the toxic feminine expresses itself as a way to get what they want from the masculine. And the way that, the way that she is going to step into her power in this dynamic is to access more of her masculine energy is to get in touch with her masculine energy. So what she's going to do is she's going to feel into her own ability to be secure She's going to feel into her own ability to be grounded within herself. She's going to connect to her own sense of worth in, in, in who she is, in what she has to offer, in the gifts that she has. So she's going to connect to the aspects of her being that she can find security with. And as she moves from this deep insecurity, this deep fear of not being enough, this need to control and manipulate because I feel if I don't control and manipulate, I'm not going to get what I want or I'm not going to get what I need. And so she's going to move from this. It's kind of like a, uh, a makeup, like a fake. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like, a. it's an overcompensation, right? It's like, I'm not enough. So I'm going to make up for it by pretending to be something I'm not, by manipulating and controlling, by guilting, by being a victim, right? I'm going to use all of this toxicity to overcompensate for the aspects of me that I feel are not enough. Well, when I grow into that enoughness by being connected to my value, by being connected to what I offer, by being connected to the things that are amazing about me, by being connected to the aspects of myself that can hold change, right? So a relationship comes into my life and a relationship leaves my life. Well, there's a part of myself that can hold the change, right? So I don't need to try to avoid the change or hide from the change or, or run from the change or, or control the change. I can just hold the change as it moves through me, right? And this is where security is found. Now, these are all, these are all healthy masculine aspects, right? So by the toxic feminine, Connecting to the healthy masculine, which is the energy of being a protector, being a provider, being secure, being able to stand on my own two feet, being grounded in who I am. As the toxic feminine connects to the healthy masculine, she is able to move into her healthy feminine, right? Because now that she feels safe, she feels secure, she feels worthy she feels valuable. She, she has, she has built an identity around things that are secure and, and, and things that are value based. Now she's let go of the need to manipulate the need to control the need to play the victim, the need to guilt or the need to, you know, nitpick or criticize or, or all that kind of stuff. And so she's now feeling secure enough to express her authenticity which, you know, this is the beautiful thing. Like it is her femininity, right? It is these beautiful feminine qualities of being nurturing, of being loving, of being emotionally available, of being connected, of being intimate, of being connected to nature, of being wise, of being connected to the whole and something bigger than herself. And so what what I also want to say about this is the toxic feminine is going to lock into the toxic masculine because the toxic feminine is essentially rooted in an insecurity in a not feeling safe, not feeling secure. She's going to lock into a version of the masculine 
that reinforces that feeling of insecurity and not being enough, right? So this, this toxic feminine rooted in insecurity, rooted in not enoughness is going to vibrationally connect to the aspect of the masculine that reinforces that. So if you, if you were with me at the beginning, or if you weren't, I'll just say it now it is, I said that, um, the, the, the inner, or excuse me, when we say we're attracted to someone, right? When you meet someone and you feel that we call it chemistry or attraction, or it's, it's that, you know, when there's something that is happening in the relatedness between you that makes you go, Oh, I want to be closer to this person. I want to touch them. I want them to touch me. I, I, you know, there's that, uh, again, sexual attraction, chemistry, whatever you call it. When you feel that with someone, What is actually happening is you're, you're connecting with them on an energetic level. It's, it's their energy is speaking to your energy and you're going like, Ooh, I like the way this feels. And you know, we, we normally call that physical attraction. And I I just, you know, I always say like physical attraction in terms of language doesn't even scratch the surface of what that actually is. Like that is a vibrational resonance that's happening. It is, it is your, your core energy saying that this person is a vibrational match to who I believe I am. And that makes all the parts of you that get excited, start firing up and you go like, Oh, I want to get close to this person because of the resonance that you feel with them. That's not physical attraction. I mean, when I hear physical attraction, I I think like, Oh, I like the way someone looks. I mean, I, I see people all the time that I go, wow, I, I find that person physically attractive. I like the way they look, but none of that stuff inside me gets going. Right. Why? Because yeah, I might like the way they look, but there's not a vibrational resonance there. Okay. So when you are in the toxic feminine, which is rooted in an insecurity and not enoughness, which causes you to want to manipulate, which causes you to want to control, which causes you to want to guilt and go into martyrdom and go, you know, all these, all these different things that we see in the, in the toxic feminine, right? When you are in that energy, you are going to be attracted to the the version of masculinity that reinforces that energy, which is the toxic version. Okay, so you're in your insecurity. He is in his avoidance or his I can't be bothered or his I'm going to get what I want with no regard for how it makes you feel. Right? Like I really want you to get how these two energies lock up, how they connect right now, right? Toxic masculine is take what I want, regardless of how it impacts anyone else, get my needs met, get my desires fulfilled, achieve my goals, achieve my agenda, right? That's toxic masculine without regard to how it impacts anyone else or how it affects anyone else. Toxic feminine is insecurity, unworthiness, not enough, manipulation, control, victimhood, all this kind of stuff, right? Like, can you see how these two are a perfect match for each other? The more he acts out in the toxic feminine, the more it exacerbates the toxic feminine. The more he takes what he wants with no regard for how it impacts you, the more you feel insecure, unworthy, the more you try to control, the more you try to manipulate, the more you try to, uh, or the more you feel like a victim and you fall into victimhood or why hasn't it happened for me? Or I'm never going to find my person. Why do I only attract the wrong people? Right? So the more he acts in his toxic masculine, the more it validates and affirms the toxic feminine. And so the way that, the way that both are going to heal, and I've said this many times, I don't want to keep beating a dead horse with this, but, but the way they both are going to heal is by getting in touch with the opposite aspect of themselves, right? So if you're all the way over on the far end of the spectrum in the toxic femininity, you're going to embody the security that you'll find in your masculine aspects, 
You're going to embody the the groundedness and the ability to stand on your own two feet, to be in secu- to be secure in who you are, to acknowledge and recognize the gift that you are and the gifts that you offer and the value that you bring. And that will balance out the insecurity that has you fall into the toxic feminine. For him, it's going to be connecting to his sensitivity, connecting to his emotionality, connecting to his desire for intimacy, connecting to his desire to be vulnerable and to be deeply in relationship with another person and to be connected to something greater to himself and be connected to the holisticness of everything right? How everything impacts each other and how it's all connected and his ability to get connected to that, his feminine aspects is going to balance out his selfishness, is going to balance out his narcissism. It's going to balance out his myopicness. And that's when he's going to embody that healthy masculine presence. So now, and and I know I've, I've said so much in this conversation, and, and I've, I've really covered a lot here with this, but there's one more thing I want to talk about. And that's how when this woman who has gotten in touch with her own masculinity and developed a sense of security within herself, and this man who has gotten in touch with his femininity and has developed a sense of compassion and understanding and connectedness within his self. How do these two people relate with each other? Or how do they relate overall? Okay, well, first of all, when when the woman who is grounded in her own masculinity and therefore has that sense of security within herself meets the toxic masculine, she loses interest. Why? Because she's not in in her insecurity anymore, which means that she cannot vibrationally connect with somebody who is going to make her feel insecure about herself. Because she has become grounded in her own security, which is the masculine part of herself, she is now not vibrationally resonant with someone who is going to reinforce her insecurity. She is now vibrationally resonant with someone who is going to strengthen that security within herself. So what does that mean? That means that she's going to look for a partner who shows up consistent, who honors his word, who communicates clearly, who says what he wants, who lets her know that I want you and I'm going to pursue you and I'm going to show up for you and I'm going to be consistent and I'm going to text you and I'm going to call you and I'm going to plan dates for us, and I'm going to do things that make you feel special. Why? Because I, and and so now we'll flip to the other side, I, in my masculine, am connected to my feminine, which means I'm connected to my sensitivity. I'm connected to my empathy. I'm connected to how what I do affects other people. I'm connected to the holisticness of of life and everything, which means I'm connected in our relationship, which means I'm connected to the fact that the things I say and the things I do and the choices I make have an impact on you and that your happiness in this relationship is, is reflective of how I show up in this relationship, right? So me being connected to all those feminine aspects of myself is going to have me show up for you in in this relationship in a way that is the provider, that is the protector, that is nurturing, that is connected, that is vulnerable, that is able to hold you, that is able to be there for you, that is able to be understanding and connected. So these are... This is how we heal, and this is how it shows up when we heal. And so let me see, is there anything I missed? Well, one thing I said, I said that the I said that the feminine, when she is rooted in her or rooted isn't the right word, because you know, somebody who identifies feminine wants to be rooted in her feminine, but also connected to her masculine. Right? So she's rooted in her feminine president 
not president. <laughs> she's rooted in her feminine presence. And she and because and she also has a connection with her masculine presence, right? Rooted in her feminine, connected to her masculine. He is rooted in his masculine, but connected to his feminine. Okay, so now what he is when he experiences a woman who shows up in her toxic feminine, which is going to be, I'm trying to force you into a relationship. I'm, I'm pushing this, right? Because that's the insecurity, right? So when, when we try to push a relationship or we, we try to, you know, like not giving the relationship space to unfold, but trying to force an answer, that's all rooted in insecurity, right? I don't feel secure enough to let this relationship unfold. So I have to force an answer, right? So when he feels a woman doing those things, when he feels a woman who is, um, you know, expressing that toxic femininity, whether it's pushing into a relationship, whether it's manipulation, whether it's game playing, if, you know, playing hard to get one day and, and acting all in the next or, you know, like whatever it might be. But when he experiences that, he's going to lose interest because he is not vibrationally resonant with that kind of energy. He is not vibration, like that doesn't, that doesn't connect to him on his deepest levels, right? He's looking for a woman who is secure in who she is, who has that masculine groundedness, but is also deeply connected to her feminine and her authenticity and is, and is expressing, right? Is expressing that. So when these two find each other, when he in his rooted in his masculine presence, but connected to his femininity, she is rooted in her feminine essence, but also connected to her healthy masculine there's a polarity that exists here. This is where that magnetic attraction happens. This is where it's like a, but not, not the kind of magnetism that happens between two toxic people because there is, there is a toxic polarity too, right? So this is, this is a different kind of attraction where it's not like, and it feels different too, because it's not like Oh my God, I, I need you so much. Like almost this, when it's the toxic attraction, there's almost like a desperation in it. Like I need you. This kind of attraction is different. It's, it's like, I don't need you. I am perfectly content where I am. You could come, you could go. Either one would be okay with me. But I, I do want you. And it's actually like, I'm not even afraid to say I want you. It's like, I want you. Can, can, I, can I have you? I mean, maybe not in those exact words, right? But like, I remember when I, and I've often shared this story. I think I even shared it um, on the last podcast I did. But when I, first time my wife and I hung out and we spent a weekend together and we connected and we shared a kiss and we, we didn't have sex, but we stayed the night together and we snuggled and it was beautiful. And you know, in that first time that we, that we were together, um, that first weekend we spent together and I, she walked me out to my car at the end of the night and then I was going home and she was going to get on a plane and go back to New Jersey. And I asked her like, this is a, this is a great example of, of healthy masculine, right? Where I asked her, I said, so I just want to know, you know, do you see this as more of a one-time thing or is this something you would actually like to explore? because I would like to explore this, right? So that, that's a great example of healthy masculine, like owning what I want, like making it clear, making it obvious. I'm not making her guess. I'm not, you know, playing like hot and cold games, right? I'm just coming out and saying it. Like, this is what I want. Can I have it? Basically, right? it's basically what I said to her. I'm like, this is what I want. Can I have it? Boom, just like healthy, strong, masculine, being clear, being direct, going for the goal, right? I, I know what I want and I'm going for it, right? That's, that's the healthy masculine. She responded in her healthy feminine, right? She's not playing hard to get. She's not bringing any kind of manipulations here. She's just simply being authentic about what's real for her. Yes, I, I would like to explore this. And then she showed up for that exploration, 
but I want to say this, she did not pursue me. Okay, so it was, it was very clear that I pursued her. A lot of the time, I would be the one reaching out. But she would reciprocate, right? So when I would reach out, I always got an enthusiastic response. And, and I don't want to say that she never reached out, okay? Because she did. She would often just out of nowhere send me a picture, a selfie, or, or just say, how's your day going? Or plan a surprise or plan something special. So, so she would reach out from time to time. But she definitely let me do the pursuing. And there was definitely an energy in that that like, uh, like it was clear to me that if I didn't show up and make it obvious that I wanted this and that I was going to work for it, that she wasn't going to put all the work in. That if I didn't show up like I wanted this, that she was going to let it fail. But when I did show up like I wanted this, she rewarded that effort. And actually, this is what I, I'll end with this, and then I'll, I'll open up for some questions. But this is something that I remember my wife and I, um, we had, this was actually right after our wedding. Um, I'll share this. Fuck it. If, if this offends people, then they can just, uh, they can just unfollow me or whatever, or stop listening to the podcast. But, um, so this was right after our wedding. And if you, if you know the story of our wedding, our, our wedding was insane because we, our wedding got canceled first of all, because it was, it was literally scheduled for like two weeks after the shutdowns happened with the pandemic. So I think the shutdowns happened, like they happened right before my birthday, which is March 27th. So they happened right before my birthday. And our wedding was scheduled for April 17th. Okay, so like literally just a few weeks. Um, and so we had to cancel our wedding two weeks before. Then we made plans to elope to Montana like a couple months later with a group of friends. And we ended up having like this spontaneous wedding that just like came out of nowhere. We planned the whole thing in two weeks. We had some of our best friends there. And it was like this tiny little wedding out in the middle of Glacier Park in Montana in the mountains. It was the most beautiful setting I'd ever seen in my life. And our friends like showed up and they all brought decorations. And we rented a reception hall from this hotel. The hotel wasn't even open, but we convinced them to let us rent the reception hall. And, and like our friends came in and decorated and we had, we were able to get a caterer to cater the event. We had this beautiful wedding that just spontaneously occurred at like in two weeks out of nowhere in the middle of a pandemic. It was, it was like one of the most miraculous experiences of my life. But anyway, uh, I digress there. Uh, some of our friends, um, for our, as our wedding gift, this shows you, you know, our, who our friends are. Our friends brought, brought us, uh, some certain plant medicine, for our, uh, as a wedding gift. And so I think it was like two days after our wedding, we went out to Lake Bowman in Glacier Park, Montana. Anyone who's ever seen Lake Bowman, it's like one of the most beautiful scenes I've ever seen in my life. And we took the plant medicine. We, we, we spent like four hours, maybe six hours on the side of this lake. Um, just, just sitting in front of the lake and the view and the mountains. And it was, it was like one of the most beautiful experiences of my life. Um, but then we're driving back, um, you know, we're sitting by the lake for like six hours and then we're driving back down and we started talking about masculine and feminine polarity and, and these dynamics. And this is when we actually came up with this. So I told you all of this to get to this point, And this is what I'm going to end with is this dynamic of challenge and reward. And this is something my wife and I came up with together. And this is. This is how, uh, what do I want to say? It's, it's how you, it's how you activate the energy to have a man pursue you. That's what I'll say. Now it's so, so the enter, the, the dynamic is challenge and reward. And it's similar to what I was talking about earlier, right? So when my wife and I started dating, she she challenged me. And when I say challenge, I know sometimes that word can be misinterpreted. She wasn't bitchy. She wasn't nasty. She wasn't harsh. She wasn't difficult. Okay. So 
Like when I say challenge, don't, don't take it to mean those things. But what I mean is she wasn't easy. Okay. She was clear about who she was. She was clear about what she wanted. She like frequently would challenge me to step up in our relationship. And it wasn't like, it wasn't like, listen, you need to do this or I'm going to be out of here, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't like that. That, that's, That's like totally bitchy and nasty. And my wife was never like that. But what she would do is she would have conversations with me sometimes. And she would say, you know, this happened or that happened. And I, I'll share this example. I often share this example where she brought up to me one time about how I was traveling a lot for work at the time. And I would, you know, be in North Carolina one day in New York city, the next day in South Florida, the next day. And, you know, she was saying to me how it was concerning for her that I traveled for work because long-term she wanted to have a family and she wanted to have kids and she didn't want to be, she didn't want to end up in a situation where she would raise the kids by herself. Right. And so she, she would actually bring, she actually literally brought up this conversation and it was within the first couple months of us dating. She brought up this conversation of, you know, I just want to talk about like, how do you think we might handle that down the road if we end up getting there? Like, how might we handle that? Because I'm just, I'm really afraid to end up in a situation where we have a couple kids and I'm at home all the time with the kids and you're always gone. And that's not the kind of life I want to have. And so what she would do when I say she challenged me was she wasn't just like, yeah, whatever you want, it's all cool. Let's live life on your terms, right? She wasn't like that. She was like, no, I have terms too. I have things that are important for me and I really want to find out if this relationship can meet my needs. If this is a relationship that I can be happy in long term. And if it's not, then I'm going to let this relationship go. And so this was how she challenged me and she did this in many ways. And you know, I don't want to I don't want to go on and on because we've been going for a while now, so I don't want to go on and on in all the different examples, but my point is is that she wasn't easy. She didn't make this relationship easy for me. She challenged me. And what she was doing was she was finding out and like, I commend her for this. I think it's amazing that she did this. She, she was finding out, are you going to be the man who can step up and provide the life I want to have? And not like, not like I was going to provide it for her. Like she wasn't a participating person in this. But she was, but she was challenging me to, to, to find out like, are you going to be the man who's going to step up and co-create this life with me? Or are you going to be another little boy who's going to be a pain in the ass to me? Right? Like, like that's what she was figuring out. And I commend her for that. And what I want to say, the other side of this is that when I would step up to one of her challenges, she would reward that effort. And it's not like a, it's not like a tit for tat. It's not like, okay, you did this. Now I'm going to reward you with this. Okay. You did this. You get a cookie. You know, I'm not a dog. She wasn't giving me a treat. Okay. It's not like that, but there was a certain energy in our relationship that the more I stepped in to being that masculine presence that she wanted to have in our life, in her life, the more she showed me how much she appreciated that. And the more she showed me how grateful she was in this relationship and the more she found like creative ways to, to like show me how much me being that space in her life was appreciated. And so what there, what there was, was this very natural, um, energetic dynamic in our relationship where she was calling me to pursue her. She was calling me to be the masculine presence that she wanted in her life. And the more I stepped into that, the more she rewarded that, the more she showed me how much she appreciated me being that for her. But she wasn't going to be the reward without first calling me into that challenge. And and I I think, you know, this is something I see and I coach a lot of women 
And I see a lot of women will jump into a new relationship with someone and men probably do this too. But I think it is, I think it is more of a feminine, a feminine aspect where women will jump into a new relationship with someone and they will start rewarding when, when that person has not risen to any challenges, right? So I'm going to give you the best of me. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to bend over backwards. I'm going to make myself available. I'm going to, I'm going to give you all my best without ever challenging you to step up and be that masculine presence for me. And that is when, you know, a, a couple things can happen. Like one, you open yourself up to just have someone take advantage of that. But two, you, um, you're not, you're not inviting him to pursue. And like, I'll, I'll just say there's, there's something in the masculine consciousness in which the pursuing builds attraction. It builds value. It builds anticipation. It builds excitement. It, it plays into this masculine um, approach of work towards the goal. Right. Which is, as I, as I said, you know, that, that is, that is the masculine consciousness, right? It's work towards the goal. It's achieve the goal. It's get the job done. It's complete the mission. Right. And so, and so that's where I, th I think this masculine need to pursue comes from is it's, he doesn't, he doesn't really want it all just here you go, have it all right. He wants it in stages. He wants to work for it. He wants to pursue something and work towards something and build something and, and have the, like be able to sit back and reap the benefits of his work. I think that is a part of the masculine consciousness very much. And w what I'll say too is like, as I think about it, that has never really ended in our relationship, you know, um, there's always been something new to work towards. And there, there's always been like a new level that this relationship has been calling me into, you know, it was the level of being a, a boyfriend. And then it was the level of being like a committed partner and we're engaged and we're going to get married. And then it's the level of being husband. And now it's like, you know, we're, we're buying a house, we're moving. Like now it's going to be the level of like homeowner and, and like, um, you know, really like, like all of this, you know, all, everything that comes with that. And then, you know, we're planning for a family. So it's going to be the level of father. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Like the way our relationship has been, there's, there's never been an end to the pursuing that's been happening in our relationship. You know, I, I've been, I've been continuing to pursue that next level of of the masculine presence that I can be in this relationship. So, um, yeah, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to end with that. And, you know, I, I know there's a lot here and, and like, you know, I've gone for almost an hour and a half and there's just, uh, <laughs> there's just so much here that I, um, you know, I, I feel like I could, I could still just talk about each of these things for another hour you know, there's just so much nuance to all of these different aspects, but you know, what, what I want you to, what I want you to take away, if there, if there were a couple of themes that I could just distill from today's conversation is, you know, one is that there is, there is a toxic aspect to masculinity and there's a toxic aspect to femininity. And we are all going to have those within us especially if we haven't done any work, right? It's just, it's like, look, the, the world is dominated by the toxic masculine. We've all grown up in the patriarchy. Okay. And, and the toxic masculine perpetuates the toxic feminine. And so we are all going to have these, um, a part of us. And so wherever you, wherever you experience your toxic masculine or your toxic feminine, the ways to heal that are to connect to the healthy aspects of the opposite sign, 
right? So I don't know if sine is even, of the opposite energy, that's a better word. Sine is not the right word for that. But um, so if you're in your toxic feminine, you would connect to being that protector, that provider, that safety, that security, right? And that will, that will help you heal and grow out of your toxic feminine. If you're in your toxic masculine, you're going to connect to the sensitivity, the understanding, the compassion, the love, the connectivity, the creativity, right? And that's going to help you balance out those rough edges of your toxic feminine. The more you grow into the healthy aspects of your masculinity or your femininity, and the more grounded you become in your femininity or your masculinity in a healthy way, the more you become the vibrational resonance for a healthy masculine or feminine opposite, right? The more you will naturally resonate, resonate with that healthy energy. The healthy masculine is going to show up as a protector, provider, honorable, caretaker. The healthy feminine is going to show up as the nurturer, the mother, the the kindness, the generosity. So in, um, in relationship, there's a certain polarity that happens between these two. This is where attraction occurs. This is where sexual charge occurs, right? And, and I want to say like sexual charge definitely occurs between the toxic masculine and the toxic feminine, but it also occurs between the healthy masculine and the healthy feminine. Um, okay. So I, I think I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stop there. I have seen, I have seen a few questions come in and I, I know I've gone for quite a while now, so I'm, I'm only going to have maybe just 15, 20 minutes to take questions, but I definitely want to answer a few of them because there have been some good ones coming in. Um, so let me just take a moment. I'm going to find one or two questions to speak into here. So I want to start with this question from Jojana Eva, and she asks, is it toxic to want to have access on your man's phone? Um, so, so let me share this. My wife and I have had complete access to each other's phones since day one. At any time we want, we can pick up each other's phones. We have the passcode. We can open it up. We can look through it. That being said, I have never once looked at her text messages or emails or anything. As far as I know, she has never once looked at mine. Um, you know, if you're, if you're at a place in a relationship where you want to have access to your partner's phone, I would say there's probably something else to work on there. You know, like... If you, let me put it this way. Like my wife and I have an open door policy in our relationship. And this is something we've discussed since day one. It's like, if you want to go, there's the door. And yeah, we might have a talk about it. Like, you know, if, like if my wife were to come to me today and she were to say, I want to leave, I want to find a new relationship. I want to be single. If she were to say that to me, like, I wouldn't just be like, okay, there's the door. I'd be like, are you sure? What's going on? Can we talk about it? Like, tell me what's going on. Like, let's, you know, are, are you open to saving this? Like, would you like to go to therapy? Would, you know, like I would definitely have some questions. I would want to talk it out. But if she were, if she were like in it, like I am clear, I am done. I do not want this. I want out. I like, I'm just done. Then I would say there's the door. Like I just would. Like there would be nothing in me that would want her to stay for me, to make me happy. Like, no, go find your happiness. And I know she would be the same way with me. And yeah, it would hurt and I would have to cry it out and go to therapy and work through it and, and do everything on my end. But I would do that because I would want her to find her happiness. And so like, I don't need to check her phones or check what she's doing or who she's with or when she's gonna be back or like, I don't need to like check into all that stuff. I don't like, you know, my wife works with her ex-husband. She's actually probably with her ex-husband right now as we're talking because they work together. And so she goes into the office one, two days a week. And when she's there, she sees him. 
They worked together when they were married and they never stopped working together. They've worked together all these years. They, they got divorced 10 years ago. Okay. Like I don't need to keep her away from her ex-husband. She has ex-boyfriends. Like we're going, we're actually going to go have dinner with her ex-boyfriend and his wife, uh, Thursday night this week. And, you know, I don't really talk to any of my exes that much, but there have been times when an ex of mine reached out to me. And I remember one, like an ex of mine reached out to me one night and she's like, Hey, I'm moving to Mexico. I'd love to see you before I go. Can we get together? And I was like, yeah, sure. Let's go get ice cream. And I I told my wife, I was like, Hey, I'm going to meet, meet up with so-and-so for ice cream. My wife was like, awesome. Have a great time. And we went out and got ice cream. And that was the last time I saw her. We, you know, we haven't talked since other than maybe, you know, shooting a comment on Facebook every now and then. But the point in all of this is, is we don't need to micromanage what the other person is doing because the other person could do whatever they want. If they don't want this, they are free to go find something else. And because we have a relationship that has been built on choice and mutual commitment, we don't have those kinds of fears in our relationship. We don't have those kinds of jealousies. And so if you're in a relationship where you have those kinds of fears and you have those kinds of jealousies, like I have, I have to assume one of two things. One, either your relationship is not built on the right foundation and you need to restructure your whole relationship, which is something you can do in therapy. So I I would suggest getting a good therapist and restructuring this whole relationship. Um, that would be my first recommendation. Or if your relationship is really solid, but you just have some trauma that is making you be insecure when there's no need to be, then you've really got to address that before you destroy this relationship. So is it toxic to want to have access to your man's phone? Well, I would say it is, it is a quality that is representative of the toxic feminine. It is because it's based in insecurity. It's based in fear. So it is a quality that comes from that. Now, is it absolutely toxic in and of itself? No, like my wife and I have been coaching couples and there have been couples who are rebuilding trust after a period of infidelity, right? And so in a situation like that, I have recommended like, okay, so for a period of time, right? You're going to give your partner complete access to your phone and they're going to be able to look through it anytime they want. Why? Because you've broken the trust, right? And and they don't trust you anymore. They don't believe what you say anymore, right? Because you have, you have ruined that. And so now you need to go through a period of time of earning that back, that trust of earning back that ability for them to believe what you say. And if something that is going to support them in doing that is for them to go through your text messages every night and see who you've been texting and what you've been saying to them. And that's going to help them build confidence in you. Then, you know, that's not necessarily a horrible thing for a period of time. But ultimately, if the relationship is going to have any chance of real success, it it can't be like, let me put it this way. Any relationship that is going to have any chance of real success cannot be founded in you trying to control what the other person does or doesn't do. Like at some point you are going to need to trust because I mean, honestly, if they really want to do that, they can have a private messenger that's encrypted that you don't even know about that's hidden on their phone somewhere, or they could have a second phone that they keep hidden from you. Right? So like you wanting to go through their messages it's just a band-aid. It's not a solution. If they really wanted to hide it, they would find a way. They would do it in their emails. They would do it like, you know, so just, this is where you've got to be wise enough to see that if you need to control him, there's a bigger problem there. And I want to say the healthy integrated feminine would not be trying to control who her man texts or when he texts him. She would be having the difficult conversations with him to find out if he's the kind of man who can provide the safety and security that she needs in a relationship. And she would be challenging him to step into being that man. 
And if he wasn't stepping into being that man, she would be getting ready to let him go. Right? So this is actually a great example, a great example of contrast, right? Toxic feminine, give me access to your phone. Give me access to your emails. I'm going to call your exes. I'm going to tell them to stop calling you. I'm going to write, I'm going to control and manipulate the situation. Toxic feminine versus healthy feminine is I want to know if you're going to be the masculine presence who can make me feel safe and protected, who can make me feel honored, who can make me feel valued and appreciated. I'm going to challenge you to step up and be that masculine presence for me. And if you're not going to do that, then I'm going to get ready to let go of this relationship. So those are, those are like, actually, that's a really great example of contrast between healthy feminine and toxic feminine. Um, so thank you for the question. Beautiful question. And um, just sending you so much love. Okay, question from Jojo NV7. Thank you for the question, Jojo. She says, How can we meet these men? And I want to speak into this one because, you know, um, I will say that, ladies, you have you have maybe slightly more of a challenge here. And I don't think, you know, it's like some people, especially on social media, go around saying there are no good men out there. All men are narcissists. All men are toxic. It's not true. Okay. I mean, I, I did an interview series, which actually I should, I should put this up for sale one of these days, but, but I did an interview series, um, a couple years ago where I interviewed 20 honorable and committed men to find out how they committed, why they committed, when they committed, what made them commit, to hear their journey of, you know, really healing their toxic masculinity and and becoming ready to commit to a feminine partner, right? So I, and, and, you know, like, I want to say, like, I put together a list of like 30, 40 men before I even did the interviews of, of men I would just want to interview on this. And I reached out to friends and I said, hey, do you, do you know somebody who would be good for this project? And I got recommendations from friends. And what I want to say is like, there are so many good, honorable men in the world. But I also want to say that the world is dominated by the patriarchy. You know, toxic masculinity is the pervasive energy that rules the world. And there is a very, very strong presence of toxic masculinity on the planet. So I do want to acknowledge that ladies, I I don't think it's to the extent of there are no good men out there. It's impossible. No, I mean, I hear, I hear it all the time from women I'm coaching where I met a man and he's in AA and, you know, like he might be in his fifties and, you know, he's in AA and he's been in recovery for 10 years and he's turned his life around and, and he's really working on being a positive masculine force in the world. Right. Or, Or here's this guy who, you know, runs a men's group and, you know, and he's, you know, like, so I I just, I hear these things all the time and like these men really are out there, but the question is where can we meet them? Right. And what I want to say is like dating apps are probably not the place where you're going to meet them. Now you might like there, there are a handful of these men on dating apps and you can meet them there because they're having a hard time with it just like everyone else is. But what I want to say is the men who are living in a healthy masculine energy and are working at being a healthy masculine force in the world are usually, um, you know, going, living by the masculine rule of accomplish the mission, get the job done, right? Accomplish the goal they are usually living that purpose in the world, right? So whether they're doing it with their children, if they have children, whether they're doing it by running a men's group, whether they're in AA and they sponsor people, whether they are, you know, have a career that is really meaningful to them and they're dedicated to their career, whether they're, um, you know, traveling and, and, you know, exploring and, and, you know, doing things, but whatever they're doing, whether they're, you know, training animals or training people or into fitness or, you know, but, but the, the point is, is that a man who is grounded in his healthy masculine is also connected to his purpose. 
And so, whereas, you know, men who are more in their toxic masculinity tend to not have that much going on. Maybe they work their little job or they do their little things that they do, but they have a lot of free time to sit and be on dating apps and hook up with random girls. And, you know, like I, I had a guy hire me to coach him who, you know, he, he actually hired me because he was ready to start healing his toxic masculinity. And he told me that for the last, for the last 40 years, not 40 years, 20 years, um, all he had really done was sat by his pool, invested money and invited girls from dating apps over to hook up with him. And he'd been hooking up with a different girl every, every, you know, couple weeks for the last 20 years and just sitting by his pool, getting drunk and hanging out. Right. So men who are living in their toxic masculine often have a lot of time to sit on dating apps and fool around with random girls and, you know, live that kind of life. Men who are grounded in their healthy masculine are often very engaged with their purpose in the world. Again, whether that's their career, whether that's their children, whether they're out being connected to nature, whether they're traveling the world, whether they're running a men's group, whether they're in AA, like, you know, all the different ways this could show up, but they're usually connected to a purpose and they're usually living that purpose, which is why dating apps are not the best place to meet them. And so this is the recommendation I always make when people ask, you know, where can I meet good men? Or even when men ask, like, where can I meet a partner? Like, go out in the world where people are living their purpose and be in those environments. And, you know, something I would say is be doing that yourself. So I talk about, you know, like my wife and I, um, how we met, we met um, in a personal development seminar. And I want to say this, this exact seminar, I can probably count over a hundred solid couples that are still together today from 10 years ago when I was doing this seminar and they all met in the seminar. Like, I remember my buddy saying to me, like, man, it, like this is a buddy who also met his wife in this program. We both met our wives in this program. And he said to me, like, man, if you can't meet someone here like you just better give up altogether because like it doesn't get better than this. But why was it that way? Right? Like we've got to ask, well, why was it that way? It was a collective of people who were coming together to work on themselves. So the men, the women, and, and there were lots of, I mean, there were lots of everybody, lots of gay people, lots of trans people. Like there, there were, there were so many people of all different kinds in this program, but everybody who was there, was there with the intention to better themselves. They were there to work on their purpose. And there are so many environments like this. I mean, like, go to Tony Robbins, go to Joe Dispenza, go on a retreat, go on, I'm going on a retreat this summer where I'm going to go swim with wild dolphins in the Bahamas, right? I'm going to be with a group of conscious people, like, you know, unconscious people don't do things like this right? Unconscious people don't go swimming with wild dolphins for a week. They just, they don't, they don't do, they do other things, right? So if you go to the environments where healthy, conscious people are following their passion, are pursuing their goals, are, you know, enjoying themselves, are improving some aspect of their life. If you're going to places like that and you're doing it not to meet someone, because that's, that's a big pitfall, right? If you go to these places to meet someone, well, you're going to be the weirdo on the outsides who's only there to meet someone while everyone else is jumping in and engaging and having a great time together. So you can't go there to meet someone. You've got to go there to express yourself authentically, to, to participate authentically with the activities that are happening there. But I mean, there is so much of this stuff happening in the world. And there are so many great, amazing men and women that are participating in these things. I mean, there are, there are even retreats where men and women go for a weekend to, 
to meet people, right? So it's like, it's like actually a retreat for men and women where they go, they do breath work, they do, you know, they listen to like seminars and they have meals together and they do workshops together and they spend like a whole weekend in a group of men and women and they're there with the intention to learn and grow and work on themselves and meet people at the same time. And like so many people find their partners at places like that. So these things exist. And I would say like, if you, if you are someone who is sitting there going, how do I meet these people? Where are these people? Why can't I find them? There is a whole other level of you getting engaged with your own passion that you just haven't touched on yet. And when you get engaged with your own passion, the things that light you up, you're not going to be asking how to meet people anymore. Now you might be, you might be going, um, you might be going like, when am I going to meet someone? Right. Because maybe you're in an environment where you're meeting lots of people, but you just haven't met the right person yet. Okay. That's fine. Right. So you might be going, when am I going to meet someone? But you're not going to be asking, how am I going to meet someone? And I just want to say this, you know, when I was single, I, I was involved in the seminar where I met my wife that I was talking about earlier. I was also involved in a native American church. I was also very involved in yoga. I also had a satsang group that I would go to on Wednesday nights where we would sit and discuss A Course in Miracles and a lot of us would go out to dinner afterwards. Um, I was involved in like my work in terms of coaching and like uh, going to different places to lead groups and things. So like I share all of this because all I was simply doing was following my passion, doing what I loved, being around other people who loved those same things. But I'll tell you what, I never, ever worried about how I was going to meet someone. I was meeting people all the time, all the time. Now, sometimes I wondered if I was ever going to meet the right person. Sometimes I wondered if I would ever meet someone who liked me back. Sometimes I wondered if I would ever meet someone that I could get out of the friend zone with. So, so like, yes, I, I did have those fears, those insecurities, and those doubts, but I never wondered how I was going to meet someone. I met people constantly every day, or at least, at least two, three times a week, I was meeting new people. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this yoga. I mean, I was involved in yoga. I think I did, but regardless. So I'm going to end with that question. And, and I just want, I want to leave this message with everybody is find your tribe. You know, um, I said this in a post earlier this week, but it's like work on yourself relentlessly work on yourself relentlessly, you know, read books, go to retreats, go to seminars, go travel the world, go like, just, just do anything and everything you can to work on yourself because that is going to one, have you become the best version of yourself. And two, it's also going to connect you with other people who are becoming the best versions of themselves. And those are two things we need to heal and to find love right? So you're going to be healing. You're going to be doing the best thing you could possibly do for yourself. And at the same time, you're going to open your life up for love and you're going to be embodying the energy that invites love. All right. So we had some beautiful questions today. Thank you to those of you who uh, left questions to those of you who are with me live. Thank you for being with me live. It's always a pleasure. Um, to those of you who would like to catch the recording or listen to this again, um, I just want you to know that it is available on the Conscious Love Show podcast. Um, you can find it on all major platforms, again, Apple, Spotify, Google, um, and so on. So, uh, yeah, just, um, do, uh, do that, subscribe to the podcast, wherever you can find it. And you'll have this conversation and many other great conversations. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think that's about it. Sending lots of love to all of you today. Thank you for being with me. Those of you live, those of you joining on the podcast, it's been really awesome being with you today, sending so much love and I'll see you back here next week. All right, everyone have a fantastic rest of your day and I'll see you next week. Bye. Thanks again for checking out the show. 
please subscribe on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on the most. And I would love it so much if you leave a review and tell people what you think of us. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at The Living Relationship to connect more closely. And I'm grateful to be supporting you on your journey to love.